You are one blessed minute from service. Hey, family, we just left the voting booth. Good morning, New Covenant. I'm Audra Turner, and I also bring you greetings from my parents, Diaconates, Charlie and Geneva Murray. Uh, it's Janine's first time voting, uh, and we're so excited that we got to cast our vote to do our part. I just want to thank you, all of you who have early voted and remind you to still early vote this weekend and of course on election day. We are asking you to do your part. Uh, it's your stewardship responsibility. We miss you all being able to worship in the sanctuary with you, but aren't we blessed to be able to stay connected and still have worship service virtually with our pastor, Leroy Rose III? For you to give God thanks. Enjoy the worship service this morning, and as always, stay safe and God bless. May God bless y'all as you go and do it. Let's get it done. Well, praise the Lord, family. I greet you today in the strong name of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's the first Sunday in the month of November. This is the month that we offer thanks and gratitude to God. He's blessed us and kept us all year long in the midst of a pandemic. And yet we're still here. We're still blessed. We are still showing our thanksgiving and gratitude unto the Lord. The text, the Bible says, be thankful unto him. And that's absolutely what we're going to do today and in the days to come. Uh, we honor God for you being in worship with us, even virtually today. I want to pray with you as we enter into worship on this Lord's Day. Father, in the name of Jesus, we honor you and thank you so much for the privilege of gathering together. We pray now that this service today will be a blessing to all who experience it. God, may your presence, your spirit, your power be that which we need even in this moment. Enter into our space. Sanctify our space. Cause it to be the environment in which you are able to move freely. We yield, God. We give ourselves to you afresh. Now have your way today and every day. This is our prayer in the name of the Lord Jesus. And together we say, Amen. Amen. Well, God bless you. Come on, let's have a wonderful time of worship on this Lord's Day. I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Our feet shall stand within thy gates. Oh, come on. I will bless the Lord at all times. And his praise shall be in my mouth. Hit me. Lift up a shout of praise right where we are. And glorify God and magnify him for who he is. Hallelujah. God, we thank you for the way that you made it. We thank you for bringing us to this hour of worship. We ask, oh God, that you would come in where we are and that you would help us through whatever we're going through. We bless you, God. We glorify you. We want to lift you high in the name of Jesus. Amen. Hallelujah, hallelujah. How many came to give God a praise this morning? I want you right now, wherever you are, to put your hands together.
wherever we are right now, God. And we're asking you to fill us up. Fill us up, God, until we overflow. Increase you and decrease us right now in the name of Jesus. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. You are worthy of all the honor, all the glory, and all the praise that belongs to you, Jesus. Thank you, God. Oh. 
in these unprecedented times, as the world feels the pressure of this turbulent climate, God's word still holds true. But my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Our mission is clear. Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Your financial support allows us to continue that mandate. And we can do that in four ways. You can give electronically through Givelify or Pushpay. You can drop off your giving at New Covenant Monday through Friday, 10 to 2, and Sundays, 11 to 1. You can call the business manager to process your giving over the phone, or you can mail it in. So please know that as you continue to give, New Covenant is able to remain a beacon of hope for our community and abroad because of your generosity. Well, family, what a wonderful time we've had in worship to this point. And I just thank God that after several months, we are still able to engage together in this form, this fashion. I want to thank you uh, for uh, the way you uh, loved on our family last week. We celebrated my wife's birthday. I, I told you last week it was her birthday. And thank you all for reaching out to her. Um, what a blessing you've been, you are to our family. I also want to say that today is my youngest child's birthday. I just wanted to throw that in there. Jaya turns uh, eight today, and God be praised uh, for the blessing she is to our family. It's also an important time in the life of the church and the life of our community because we are just days away from national election. And I want you to hear my heart in this, that there are so many variables, so many things that are going on. Thank God for all those who voted uh, to this point, early voted or turned in your vote by mail ballot. But I want you to know, uh, if you're the one who's waiting to Tuesday to vote, then I want you to, I want you to do that. You gotta do that. But all of us can participate in praying and trusting God that his will might be done. Here, here's what the Lord said to me, and I want, I want to be clear. I'm, I'm leading uh, toward the preaching for today, that God said clearly to me uh, that this is the season for us to stay with God. I want you to hear me. You'll hear that over these next several weeks throughout the preaching moment, uh, that God says that we cannot walk away from him during this season. No matter what Tuesday brings, we got to stay with God. No matter how things shape up with uh, the economy and the social uh, injustice and how, how things are happening in our community, you and I must commit, resolve to stay with God. Hope you're hearing me today. Uh, there's a text uh, in, in, in uh, uh, the Psalm, Psalm 27, verse 14, and it talks about wait on the Lord. Be of good courage and he shall strengthen your heart. Again, I say wait on the Lord. I love that text, but when you really dive deep into what wait means right there, it is the sense of being tied and twisted, tangled together, meaning that there, there is a connection that cannot be broken. I hope you hear me today that God says that you and I must be so tied with God, so tangled with him that nothing can break that connection. Resolve today that there will be nothing that will cause you to walk away from him. You and I, we've got to stay with him. I love the way the Message Bible puts it in this same verse, that Psalm 27, verse 14, it says, stay with God, don't quit, don't lose heart. I'll say it again, stay with God. Go ahead and read it. I want you to know that God wants us to know that in the midst of turbulent times, chaos and trouble, Tribulation, there's one thing you and I can count on. And that's that God will never leave us nor forsake us. We've got to stay with him. Today, I'm delighted to introduce two of our associates who are going to share the word of the Lord today. Uh, Associate Pastor Canada, uh, Minister Hurl Canada will be uh, preaching the word of the Lord. And then we thank God for Executive Pastor Minister Brandon McRae who's going to be also preaching. They're going to do a tag team kind of thing uh, where the one simple message, two voices, one simple message. 
that you and I, we've got to stay with God. I want you to receive them as they share the word of the Lord today. It's going to be wonderful.
Praise the Lord, the covenant. Praise the Lord. Our message today is coming from Hebrews, the 12th chapter, verses 1 and 2. Our, our message is that we all need to stay with God. Let me read those verses for you. Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down on the right hand of the throne of God. The Jewish Christians to whom the epistle to the Hebrews is addressed were, were demoralized and discouraged. Christianity had proven difficult for them. It was radical. It set aside centuries of tradition. It emphasized a new but troubling kind of spiritual freedom. And more than anything else, it incurred the wrath of the Jewish religious establishment. Many converts were ready to turn back and to leave the uneasy, uncharted waters of faith for the comfortable, familiar life of works and moral effort. This was the choice they faced, depending on the law or moral effort, trying to appease God or trusting God in him. A complicated religious system or a simple relationship with the living God through Christ. After reminding these immature believers of the superiority of Jesus Christ, the writer of Hebrews, beginning in chapter 10, verse 19, demonstrates for them the superiority of faith. Faith means we cannot see the outcome. We are not sure of what lies ahead, but we are convinced of the reality of God. In other words, we're not sure what the future holds, but we know who holds the future. Faith means clinging to the hope that God will eventually triumph. He will come back to earth in judgment to reward those who have sought after him. And so we obey. We do God's bidding, even when submission is hard. The heroes of faith in Hebrews chapter 11 model the response that Christians today should copy. They believed God, and consequently, they obeyed his mandate. Regardless of the consequences, it is this kind of willing trust that pleases God. Anything less will not do. Those who have faith, those who do not have faith, cannot see past the physical world around them. They are limited by their temporal circumstances and are blind to what God is doing. But those whose spiritual eyes are open can see the spiritual realities which transcend this world. Their hope is in God's strength and in his faithfulness. In that hope, they find the strength to endure, to stay with God. When it comes to faith, the world scoffs. Faith at best seems like a great waste. At worst, it seems almost suicidal. Do we really want to give up all the pleasures of this world for something elusive and otherworldly? Faith is never easy. But the more convinced we are of the reality of an all-good, all-powerful God, the more our trust will grow and the less we will be overwhelmed by doubts and temptations. Today, we people here in the United States have much different circumstances, but we still need to hear this message as much as the Jewish Christians did. Here, we have freedom of religion, and we are not being persecuted 
because of our religion. But there are at least three reasons we need this message's mandate in order to stay with God. The first reason is our political situation. The U.S. has seen more civil unrest this year than we have in decades. The best statistics that I could find indicate that from May 26th to September the 5th, there were over 12,000 incidents of civil unrest. Our current president makes statements to raise the temperatures rather than calm them down. This unrest is not limited to the large U.S. cities. Even small and mid-sized cities have experienced police brutality and demonstrations this year. The second reason we need this message is a global pandemic, COVID-19. No demographic is untouched. All people are subject to its influence. Over 8 million people have contracted the disease in the U.S. this year. Over 220,000 people have died. And now deaths are increasing at a faster rate. The third reason is the panic this nation is experiencing as our economy gets worse and worse and injustice appears to be increasing. There is no relief in sight. The crisis is getting worse and worse. And it appears that our country doesn't know what to do to correct the economy or eliminate inequality and injustice in the United States. Minister McRae, can you tell us why we must stay with God? Yes, I can. It's because of the mandate. In our text today, the writer of Hebrews gives tried and true instructions for staying with God despite external challenges. In his message to the Jewish Christians, the composer of this outstanding document of faith mandates that regardless of the persecution that we must face and endure, the threat of imprisonment and the pressure to revert back to Judaism, they've got to stay with God. And although this message uh, was, was written thousands of years ago, these timeless instructions were included in the canon of scriptures to inform us how we can stay with God no matter the circumstances and the challenges we face right here and right now. Notice what he says in verse 1, Hebrews chapter 12. If we're going to stay with God through the challenging circumstances of life, we've got to lay aside every weight and the sin that ensnares us, entangles us, entices us, and entraps us. In other words, we've got to get rid of uh, distractions and ungodliness. For some of us, distractions in our lives are the good things. Uh, they're just misprioritized in relationship to the good things of God. I'll say that again. For most of us, distractions or the weights in our lives are the good things. Work, family, friends, rest and relaxation, vacations, entertainment, but they are misprioritized in relationship to God's good things for our lives. The deceptive trap of the American dream, the pursuit of happiness, and the grind to secure the bag diverts, draws us away, and distracts us from living God's way. These weights or distractions, they keep us from maturing into focused, faithful, fruitful followers of Christ. One time, Jesus was uh, giving an interpretation of a parable to his disciples of the seed and the sower. Jesus said, some people are like the seed that was sown among the thorns. They hear the word, but the worries of this life, the deceitfulness of wealth, 
and the desires for other things come in and choke the word, making it unfruitful. The writer of Hebrews is echoing Jesus' sentiment uh, when he says that we've got to lay aside every weight and the sin that uh, gets us off track in our relationship with God. Not only must we get rid of distractions, but the word of the Lord mandates that we get rid of all ungodliness in our lives. The writer of Hebrews says it like this, the sin that ensnares us. We've got to get uh, ask ourselves, what are the things that I'm struggling with? With, with uh, what uh, sins am I struggling with in my life? And then we've got to ask God to deliver us. Because sin separates us from God. Jesus says this about sin. If your right eye causes you to stumble, gouge it out and throw it away. It's better to lose one part of your body than to lose your whole body in hell. And if your right hand causes you to stumble, cut it off, throw it away. It's better for you to lose one part of your body than for you to lose your whole body in hell. Hebrews chapter 10, 26 says, if we deliberately keep on sinning after we, uh, after we have received the knowledge of the truth, no sacrifice for sin is left. So here it is. This is the mandate. If we're going to stay with God, we've got to get rid of distractions and the ungodliness in our lives. Why must we stay with God? Because of the mandate. And the mandate of this text says that we've got to lay aside every weight in the sin that ensnares us. It says that we've got to run the race that is set before us. That means that we have to live with purpose, perseverance, and patience. We've got to move despite difficulties. The word of the Lord teaches us that if we're going to stay with God, we've got to persevere through agony, anger, and anxiety. We've got to have patience through depression, despair, disappointment, and doubt. We've got to persist through fakeness, fickleness, and fearfulness. We've got to press through hurts, uh, hindrances, and helplessness. We've got to endure injustice, inequality, and inequity. We've got to push through pain, pandemic, economic panic, and political uncertainty. My mom loves to say this verse from Ecclesiastes. It says, uh, the race is not given to the swift, nor is the battle to the strong. Jesus picks it up and he says, but to the one that endures to the end, that person will be saved. Martin Luther King Jr. said it like this, if you can't fly, then run. If you can't run, then walk. If you can't walk, then crawl. But whatever you do, keep moving forward. So keep pushing. Keep pressing, keep persevering with patience, knowing that the race of life is not a sprint, it's a marathon. And the God uh, who is the giver of, of all power, he will help us endure to the end. And if you believe that, you ought to lift your voice and say, I'm going to stay with God. And so the question remains, why must we stay with God? Because it's a mandate. Yes, the mandate of the text says that we've got to lay aside every weight in the sin that uh, ensnares us. We've got to run the race with endurance, the, uh, the race that is set before us with endurance. And we've got to look to Jesus because he is the author and finisher of our faith. We've got to have faith in Jesus because we know that it is by Jesus that we have our right to uh, access with God. That's called reconciliation. Uh, Ephesians 2 verse 8 says, for it is by grace that we have been saved through faith. That's faith in Jesus Christ, that this is not something of our own, but it is the gift of God. Romans chapter 3 verse 24 says, and all are justified freely by the grace through the redemption that came through Jesus Christ. Hebrews chapter 9 says that Jesus entered the most holy place once and for all with his own blood, thus obtaining the eternal redemption. And for this reason, Christ is the mediator of the new covenant that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance. In other words, we've got to look to Jesus because he grants us access to God. And I'm here to let you know that God is our only hope in this world. 
not only in this world, he's our only hope for eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. Why should we stay with God? Because the mandate of this message says, look to Jesus. Can we really hope in anything else? Can we really look to anyone else to save us? Can we look to the president or the vice president to save us? Can we look to the House or the Senate to save us? Can we really look to the governors, the mayors, and the city commissioners? Our U.S. dollar even says, in God we trust, but do we really trust in God? Our Pledge of Allegiance says, one nation under God, but do we really, are we really under God? Have we submitted to the authority of God which is found in his word? One time, uh, the Pharisees tried to trap Jesus. They tried to tra trap him by testing his uh, allegiance to Caesar, which was the president of the Roman government, and to God, which is the president of all things. They asked him, should we pay taxes to Caesar? Jesus said, I looked at the coin, and he took it and said, whose image and inscription is on the coin? They replied, this is Caesar's image. Jesus said, give Caesar what belongs to Caesar, and give God what belongs to God. If we're going to stay with God, we have to look to Jesus because he is the initiator and perfecter of our faith. He is our peace, protector, and provider. He's our hope, helper, and healer. He's our light, our lifter, and our leader. Jesus is our redeemer, Lord, and savior. He is the bread of life and the light of the world. He is our joy in sorrow. He's our hope for tomorrow. The mandate of, of this uh, text says that we've got to stay with God. You ought to type it in the chat. Say, I'm going to stay with God. Minister Canada, can you just lead us a little bit further? Tell us why we've got to stay with God. Oh, yes. We need to stay with God because of the model. Jesus provides us the perfect model of staying with God in spite of circumstances. The Bible says that Jesus endured the cross by focusing on the end result, the joy that was set before him. His attention was not on the agony of the cross. It is also important to note that Jesus' agony didn't necessarily start at his crucifixion, but in the garden, the night of his arrest. It is possible that his distress was so great that his blood vessels ruptured into his sweat glands, causing Jesus to actually sweat drops of blood. This medical condition is called hematidrosis and would have caused exhaustion before Jesus was dragged around Jerusalem, flogged, and crucified. Following the garden, Jesus was tried and then sentenced to a Roman flogging. Flogging was the usual punishment prior to a crucifixion, the most brutal and inhumane punishment executed by Roman soldiers. The victim was usually tied to a column, then whipped with an instrument that had three leather straps with metal or bone attached to the ends. Hooks were meant to sink into the skin and rip the flesh off. Severe blows to the chest and ribs during the scourge often caused the ribs to be ripped out resulting in excruciating pain with every attempted breath. The victim would writhe and twist in agony, falling to his knees, only to be jerked back to his feet again and again and again until he could no longer stand. Over the next few hours, there would be a slow accumulation of fluid developing around the lungs adding to his breathing difficulties. There would also be lacerations of the liver and perhaps the spleen. Jesus also provided us with the perfect model of staying with God by despising the shame. At high noon, in hot, dry conditions, Jesus had to climb about a half mile to Golgotha on an unpaved, bumpy road. 
his lacerations, open wounds, blood loss, and ripped bones and muscles would have caused stumbling, falling down, then struggling back to his feet. Finally, at the place of his death, his clothes would have been virtually glued to his body by clotted blood in the open wounds. Then they would have been yanked off, sending jolts of pain throughout his entire body. Jesus was forced to lie down while three soldiers secured his hands to the crossbar of the cross. The five inch square nails were pounded through the palm of the hand, not the wrist as so many have illustrated. His knees would have been bent until his feet were flush against the cross. Then both of his feet were nailed to the upright. Jesus would have been completely naked and the cross placed at eye level so that mockers could hurl insults and further humiliate him. The hill on which the cross was placed would have been visible to most people in the city. Hebrews chapter 12 verse 2 also says that Jesus is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Ephesians chapter 1 verses 20 through 23 helps us to understand the significance of Jesus being seated at God's right hand. Listen to Ephesians. God raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And he put all things under his feet and gave him his head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Jesus predicted that he would return to the immediate presence of his Father and receive the kingdom that was appointed for him upon the completion of his earthly ministry. God's right hand is the place of highest favor with God, the Father, and indicates his power and sovereignty. He is the Messiah of Israel and the fulfillment of the Lord's promise to keep the offspring of David on the throne forever. We are not waiting for Jesus to enter into his messianic uh, reign. He enjoys it now. All of his enemies are being put under his feet as his gospel is preached and his kingdom expands. Even now, Jesus still models stand with God for us as he sits on the throne of his father and at the right hand of God. This means that he is ruler over all and that the kings of the earth rule only according to his sovereign permission. As such, Christ alone is worthy of our highest allegiance and it is to him that we must render obedience, even if it means at times defying the rulers of this world. Jesus' kingdom is eternal, and his rule is above all others. Minister McRae, yeah. can you tell us again why we must stay with Jesus? Yes, I can. We have to stay with Jesus. We've got to stay with God because it's not a, a suggestion. It's not just another good idea. It's a must. We must stay with God as we run this race. We have uh, such a great cloud of witnesses that are standing at the finish line of life. They're rooting for us. They're cheering for us. And they're saying, hold on to the end and stay with God. Amen. Hebrews chapter 11 says, E. Abel is a witness that God accepts our sacrifice and he's rooting for us at the finish line of life. And he's saying, stay with God. Enoch is a witness 
that God is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. And he's cheery, stay with God. Yeah. Noah is a witness that God saves the righteous and he's hollering, stay with God. Abraham is a witness that God is a promise keeper and he's yelling, hold on to the end and stay with God. Sarah's a witness that God can do the impossible and she's screaming from the sidelines or from the finish line, stay with God. Yes, Isaac is a witness that God has a ram in the bush and he's crying, stay with God. Jacob's a witness that if we hold on to God and he will bless us and Jacob shouting from the finish line, stay with God. Moses is a witness that God is a deliverer and he's calling from the finish line of life. He's saying, hold on a little while longer and stay with God. Joshua is a witness that God calls walls to fall and he's waving us in and he's saying, stay with God. Rahab's a witness that God grants unmerited favor to, and, he, and she's holding up a sign that's saying, stay with God. Gideon is a witness. Barak is a witness. Samson is a witness. Jephthah is a witness. David, Samson, and all the prophets are witnesses that God's word is true. And they're all chanting from the finish line of life, hold on and stay with God. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and all, they're all witnesses of the good news of the gospel, that God has a plan of salvation for every man, woman, boy, and girl, and the testimony is, stay with God. Peter, James, John, and the apostles are all witnesses that Jesus is the Son of God. He takes away the sins of the world, and they're saying, hold on to Jesus and stay with God. Paul and Silas are witnesses that there's power in the name of Jesus to break every chain and to set the captives free. And they're shouting from the sidelines or from the finish line of the, uh, uh, of, of the uh, race of God. And they're saying to the top of their line, lungs, stay with God. There's one more witness, Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who's the joy, for, for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross and despised the shame, and he's seated at the right hand of the Father, and guess what he's saying? Hold on to your faith and stay with God. We must stay with God. It's not just a suggestion. It's not just a good idea. But we've got to hold on until the end. We must stay with God because Jesus is going to rescue his people. We must stay with God because Satan is defeated. And the power of God, by the power of God, Jesus has won the victory. And by that same power, in the name of Jesus, we have the victory. And if you believe that God is giving you the power to overcome life's challenges and that you'll finish your race. Stay with God. You ought to lift your hand. You ought to lift your voice and say, yes, I'm going to stay with God. Hallelujah. We've got to stay with God because it's a mandate on our lives. We've got to stay with God. We've got to stay with him because Jesus gives the perfect model. We've got to stay with God because it's not just a suggestion. It's not just another good idea. But because it's a must, we've got to stay with God. Will you pray with me? God, we thank you for your grace and your mercy. We thank you for your power that gives us the ability to overcome every challenge in our lives. We pray, God, that you give us the endurance to keep on going no matter what we face matter what the distractions are, help us to keep on moving forward. God, we pray that you help us, Lord, to keep our eyes on Jesus. He is the author, the finisher of our faith. Lord God, this is our prayer. We ask God that after we've finished our race, after we've run with patience, we ask God that you give us the crown of life, that you receive us into your glory. This is our prayer, God, in the name of Jesus. Amen. God bless you. Well, what a blessed time we've had in this word today. I am so thankful uh, for how God used both Minister Canada and Minister McRae 
uh, to share the word of the Lord even collaboratively with one message that we ought to stay with God. We've got reason. Did you hear the word? I heard it clearly. We've got reason to stay with the Lord, uh, a push to do so. It's, it's the mandate, it's the model, and it's the must for me, you know, that I've really got to do it. Something wells up in me that says I need to stay with him. I'm thankful for the word of God. I'm praying that it reached you right where you are. Uh, and that uh, if you are hearing the voice of God today and say, I want to stay with him, but it starts with connecting with him. I want you to know you can connect with the Lord today. You can accept the free gift of salvation. If you don't know the Lord as your savior, today ought to be your day. This moment ought to be your moment where your heart yields to him and say, Lord, what must I do to be saved? You'll, you'll hear back to you that if you would just confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart, that God raised Jesus from the dead, then you shall be, you will be saved. I thank God for that assurance. And then from that point on, our goal, our effort is to stay with God. No matter what life comes or brings our way, I'm going to stay with him. Let that be your decision today. If you make a decision for the Lord Jesus, won't you let us know so we can partner with you. Uh, and we'd love to do that. Just email connect at thecovenant.org. Uh, and we'll make sure that we respond to you, that we find ourselves in a way that walking together with him is going to be better than us doing it all by ourselves. None of us were created to live as an island. And so come on, let's partner together. It's time for our closing act of worship, time for communion on this first Sunday. And I'm thankful that God gives us another chance to commune with him. That's staying with him, didn't it? To, to abide with him, to commune with him. And so we come to this moment of communion. And my prayer is uh, that you will, you have grabbed uh, your communion elements here from the church or you're using what uh, you have uh, at your home. And I want you to, let's pray. Pray with me that God will consecrate the elements so that this moment might be used in a way uh, that will help us to reaffirm our connection and faith in a loving God. Let's pray. Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus, we thank you so much for these elements. We pray that you'll bless both bread and wine. Cause this time of fellowship and sweet communion to be that which honors you and gives you glory. Father, we pray you'll have your way. This is our prayer. In the name of the Lord Jesus, together we say, amen. The Bible says that it was on the night in which Jesus was betrayed that Jesus took bread he blessed it, he broke it, he gave it to his disciples, he told them to eat. You've got your small wafer, I've got mine. Let us partake together. Amen. When Jesus offered that which represents his blood, he said, this is my blood which is shed for many. For as often as you shall drink forth from this cup, you show my death and my suffering. Until I come again. He told them all to drink in like manner. Let us partake together. Amen. They left that moment after the bread and the cup. They went out into the Mount of Olives, singing and praising God. And that's what we're going to do. Uh, this is the first day of November. This is the day that we give God praise. Listen, I want to invite you as we close this moment out. We want to do what the scripture says. They went out singing, praising God. I want to invite you to the call tonight, Sunday night, 8.30 p.m. We are kicking off this November 1st, 30 days of Thanksgiving, our daily dose of devotion, 30 days of Thanksgiving. And we can't wait to be with you tonight at 8.30 p.m. I love you. Let me pray this prayer benediction. Father, thank you now for our time together on this day. We pray that you'll bless every person worshiped uh, even virtually with us now god may your grace and your anointing and your blessing and your favor and your covering and your healing and your kindness rest upon each of us now and forevermore and all god's people said hallelujah
Member-to-member connectivity is important for the life and well-being of our ministry. If you are interested in partnering with the new members and ensuring they stay connected, please email us at connectatthecovenant.org to let us know you want to join God's team. And for the month of November, here are the New Covenant Highlights.